So the talk is titled Why Beauty Matters, Subtitle: A Christian Approach. So we're going to be looking at this from, of course, a Christian perspective. And uh, as we talk about beauty, we're talking about that which relates to the first article, the article of creation. Now, this is an element of our theology that we generally don't really talk about very much. I mean, can you remember the last, you know, sermon or talk that you heard on, like, the beauty of God? Probably not that often, right? It's probably not something that comes up as much as it probably should. And I think there are some reasons for that culturally. So we're going to talk about why culturally things have, have shifted. All right. So I don't have a ton of slides here, but I do have some. Some things I want to show you. Uh, I, I know you probably can't see that too well, but uh, this is a very, very beautiful art piece of someone's messy bed. So if you haven't seen this before, this is, a, uh, this is an art piece. Uh, it actually is. Uh, from an artist named Tracy Emin, uh, called My Bad, in 1998. In 1999, this was um, entered into a, a very prestigious art award uh, competition, uh, and it was, which is called the, the, the Turner Prize. It's a British award for like the primary contemporary artist or artistic piece of that year. And uh, Emin, she did not win, but she was a finalist. So she got very close. So, you know, I want to think about this and ask, why, why is it that an art piece that is a messy bed, I mean, she basically said, this is her bed. This was how messy her bed is. There's alcohol, you know, empty bottles all over the place and all sorts of other things. And uh, her <coughs> is a mess, and she was living like a mess, and she wanted to display that. And so she decided that her bed it's by itself could be an art piece. Uh, and it's sold for quite a bit of money as well. It's changed hands a few times. I don't know where you would put such a thing, but okay. Uh, well, I want to go to the next work of art to look at another piece of contemporary art. Uh, now, this is an artist named Martin Creed. Now, Martin Creed is another, he's a, he actually won the Twitter Prize one year, not for this work, for another one. Uh, and if you look at a number of Martin Creed's works, I think he's a good example of kind of where a lot of contemporary art has gone. And this example of his work is called work number 701. And as you can see here, it's just a series of differently sized nails. And if you look at the rest of Martin Creed's works, they're all, they're all pretty similar to this. Uh, you know, the one that I was initially going to show, I realized I probably didn't want to show what people were eating. Uh, but he, he has uh, videos of, of multiple people vomiting. Uh, that, was, that was an art piece. Um, but I spared you that, because I want you to be able to eat food if you're uh, but the, the art piece that he uh, won the Turner Prize for, it was called The Lights Going On and Off, which was a light switch being flicked on and off in an empty room. Uh, and that, that, was, that was the art piece. Now, yes, of course, when you look at these art pieces and you listen to these artists, they have all sorts of ways of explaining why they think these things are, are art, and there is a reason behind why they present the things that they do. But I want to look at the reason why that is, and I think that has to do with the question of beauty and what we think about beauty. You know, why is it that in contemporary art, something like this can be seen as an art piece? What, what exactly shifted? Why has that changed? If you look at something like the paintings of the Renaissance, say. Uh, we don't have to look that far back, um, but... But clearly there has been a shift. I think we have to see that obviously people thought things were beautiful in the past that people don't think, at least in certain uh, positions and institutions, are beautiful anymore. So why is that the case? So I want to talk a little bit about then why it was that this notion of beauty has disappeared. Because I'm making the argument that beauty has really disappeared from our culture. So it's not just in a theological context, though we're certainly going to talk about the theological context, and it impacts the church and how we view worship and how our church buildings look. So it certainly has implications uh, for the church, but we're going to talk about it also just culturally. So there are a number of shifts that happen that change the way that we view the modern world that we have to understand to see why it is that, that beauty has shifted so much. We've lost this focus on beauty. And there's so much that I want to talk about, but I know that I'm limited in my time. So I'm going to try to, to limit this to just a few things. This is going to be a very brief summary, just so you know. Uh, so I apologize for you know, kind of the, the lack of nuance in any of this, but that's kind of necessary. 
So, okay, the first is this. The first thing that, that shifts in the modern world is that there is a loss of meaning in the external world. Okay, what, what do I mean by this? Well, in a, if you look at a classical view of thought, now classical I'm talking about that which was taught by the ancient Greeks, Plato and Aristotle, inherited by the Western world, and then of course Christianity uh, arises and grabs onto what were some of those beneficial things of the classical world, uh, and that exists through the medieval period into the time of the Reformation. But once you get to the time of the Enlightenment, a lot of what we would think about as the classical world or basic assumptions about reality start to fall apart. And this one is really key. This is really key for thinking about how people approach the world today generally. And that is the question of meaning in the world outside of me. So I'm talking about meaning and purpose in the world itself, not just inwardly. And in, in classical thought, it is believed that there is meaning and purpose in all things that, that happen in the world. So think about the, the natural world. Um, you can look at you know, something like the process of you know, photosynthesis. Uh, and you can ask something like, well, why do the plants need this kind of energy? Well, they need it to transfer it to this kind of energy. They need that so that they can grow. You know, they need to grow so they can you know, reproduce. And we could talk about our lives or the lives of animals or the, what goes on in nature in terms of, of meaning and purpose, uh, what people refer to as teleology, meaning that things inherently have meaning within them. So that means that if I encounter a world that has meaning, that my mind, as I see something, I connect with the meaning that is in that thing. The world outside of me is actually knowable. The, the purpose in the world outside of me is actually knowable. And of course, as Christians, we recognize that this is true because God has created the world and God had purpose in all of the things that he made. <laughs> now, there starts to come a shift in the modern world uh, with a figure known as Rene Descartes. You've probably heard of him, at least uh, the famous phrase, uh, cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore, I am. If you don't, you don't know anything about philosophy, you've probably heard that. Uh, the most famous phrase probably ever uttered by a philosopher. Well, in Descartes' view of the world, he's very influential uh, for just shaping the way that modern people think about reality in general. He said, well, there's not really purpose, per se, in nature. As you look at the external world, the world is kind of like a machine. And it just kind of runs, it does what it does. Now, we can maybe find meaning or create meaning, but it's not really inherent in the thing itself. It just kind of does what it does. And Descartes said, well, if you really want to find meaning, you can find it, but you have to look inward into your soul. So you're looking inward instead of outward. So the basic question, then, that, that I want to pose here is, how do you view the world? Is it that you extract meaning from the world, or is it that you impose meaning upon the world? That's crucial. That's very crucial for the modern mindset. And what happens in the move away from classical thought is essentially people move from saying the world has meaning and purpose in it, and I extract meaning from that. I understand who I am from that, to saying, no, I start with me, and I see the things around me, and then I get to impose meaning upon whatever it is that's around me. Now, this, this makes a lot of sense with um, mass production, which is the next thing, the development of technologies. Because the, the further technology develops, the more people feel like they can just manipulate the things of the world. Now, you know, if you're in an ancient society that is you know, an agricultural society, and not one where you can you know, ship foods from one part of the world to another, say if there's a famine, uh, you are really dependent just upon the forces of nature, aren't you? Because you can't really do anything else. So you're kind of forced to just pray that things would be how you want them to be, that your crops would grow, that things would work out well. But the more that technology has developed, the more people feel like they can control nature. The more we feel like we're kind of here not to be part of the natural world and the overall purposes of the world, but instead to take and mold it however we want to do so. Um, and so we have then mass production. We have industrialization. Factories, things become easier to make. And part of what happens there in terms of, of beauty is that all of a sudden, you know, things that are beautiful generally take a lot of time, don't they? Like if you look at, and we'll look at some, we can talk about some specific examples, uh, but look at, you know, classical architecture. Look at some, you know, cathedrals. 
you can't just mass produce that kind of thing. It takes a lot of people with a lot of very specific skills to spend a lot of years to put something together that is beautiful. Well, with mass production, all of a sudden we can make things really quickly. So if we're looking at for things that look nice to us or that are you know, aesthetically pleasing, we're often looking to something that we can just reproduce as quickly as possible because the more you uh, produce something, uh, the more money you can make. And so then, this gets to the next point, that everything is about utility, meaning everything is about its use. Because if something is beautiful, you don't necessarily have a use for it. Now, of course, you can have useful things that are beautiful. But if you sit outside and you know, watch a beautiful sunset, what use is that to you? It's not. Of course it's not. Like, you're not there to be like, oh, I can use this sunset for you know, getting money or whatever. Like, maybe if you're a photographer, you can or something. But, but generally, like, you understand that when you look at a beautiful thing, something that's delightful, and, and we don't have to talk about just sight. We can talk about uh, sounds as well. We can talk about music. But when you're enjoying a piece of music, you're not, you're not enjoying that piece of music because you can do something with it. You're enjoying it because of what it is. You're enjoying it for itself, for its own sake. Uh, but the more that the, the world focuses on things like economics, the more that we are producing more, uh, people are often just thinking, of, you know, especially with the rising middle class, people are thinking more about how can I make money. And when that happens, people just start to ask, well, is it useful? Not is it meaningful, is it purposeful, is it good, or, but can I use this? Can I use this to live a successful life? And that means that we're going to spend less time on those things that actually take a long time to build or uh, to create. Then the fourth point here uh, in our modern world is that we face the problem of subjectivism. The problem of everything being viewed from our own internal perspective. Now, I mentioned Descartes, uh, his famous phrase, cogito ego sum, I think, therefore, I am. Well, just to give you a very brief explanation of what that phrase actually means and what's going on there, um, it's, a, it's in a book called His, his Meditations. And Descartes essentially s starts his philosophy from a position of skepticism. He says, okay, well, how do I actually know if anything is real? Um, you know, how do I know that the world around me exists? Probably not a question that we ask ourselves too often. Uh, but, you know, he's a philosopher. It's his job. He's, it's what he's got to do. We've got to think about these kind of questions. Uh, so Descartes starts to think, well, what if, you know, I feel like things are real. These things seem real to me. But he's like, what if there was some kind of, like, evil genie out there that was just manipulating me? Maybe none of you really exist, and he's just manipulating and putting these images in my mind. Because after all, some people have you know, mental illnesses where they see things that aren't there. So maybe everything is, is that way. So what Descartes does is he tries to find a place to start to say, what is the, the starting point of knowledge? And he, he begins with doubting everything, and then he says, well, if I'm thinking, or if I'm doubting, really is what he's saying, if I'm doubting... I at least know that I exist because somebody's doubting. That's the starting point of all knowledge. Now, Descartes does go on from there to make an argument for God's existence. And uh, from there, he, he does go on to say that, you know, he thinks that things uh, beyond him do exist, for sure. Um, but it starts with the self. So you see that turn. That's really key. So when we look for truth, when we ask the questions of what is good and right or we ask the question of what is meaningful, we don't look out there, we look in here. Why do people so often say things like, well, I'm just trying to find myself? Because the thought is, I, you know, if there's a lot of bad stuff and I'm confused about things, I can find the answer by looking inward and finding some kind of meaning or purpose or me in here somewhere, if only I try hard enough, or feel the right things or do the right things. See, so that's an outgrowth of this shift. Then we have what happens with art. Is as meaning is, is lost, art really becomes more than anything else just a series of questions. And which is what those artists were doing with the artworks that, that I showed, which is why they seem as absurd as, as they are. Uh, there's a, a famous art piece that maybe is, is exemplary of this historically. 
as kind of the beginning of this by a guy named Marcel Duchamp, who was a, he was a Cubist painter for a little while, um, but then he he premiered this art piece, which is known as the Fountain. Have you heard of this before? It's very famous. It is uh, this, this installation was a urinal, and he signed it R. Mutt, not his name. Um, and this is kind of a joke, and he was kind of asking the question, well, what, what the heck is art? You know, is it because it's in a nice gallery that makes it art? Now, clearly he was, he was kind of joking around and doing this and trying to ask a provocative question. I don't think that he would have said that his uh, urinal was truly a beautiful thing. But what happens from there onward is all of a sudden, art becomes just the question with no answer. But it's one thing to have a question. It's one thing, sometimes it's good to, to, to do provocative things, sometimes maybe to, to get somewhere, because you want to lead somebody to, to truth, or to goodness, or to beauty, to, to lead somebody to something that, that is right. Sometimes you need to make a kind of shocking statement. The prophets in the Old Testament did this at times. They did some pretty weird stuff, but they did it to point toward the good. They did it to point people toward God. Well, when you don't have any God in the equation, then you just have the question. So that's all that there is. And that's why a lot of this contemporary art is the way it is. They're just asking the question, well, what is art? Is my bad art? If it's not, why not? Who says so? Who are you to decide what art is? They're trying to provoke these kind of questions, but there is no answer. They're not even attempting to give you an answer. And these artists say that Martin Creed, uh, if you ever watch interviews with him, um, he's, a, he's an interesting guy, but he, um, and when people ask him questions about his art, he's just like, I don't know. Am I an artist? What is it? That's all you get. Um, so the other thing that we have in our modern culture is we're just constantly stimulated, which means we're not really looking for beauty as much as we are looking for just immediate pleasure. Okay, so beauty is something that's beautiful is is pleasurable. We are pleased by that which is which is beautiful. You know, if you see a beautiful sunset, you enjoy it. You delight in the beautiful sunset. And you could probably look at that and say, well, I enjoy that. That is beautiful. Probably nobody in the room would say that a, beautiful, that a sunset is not beautiful. We pretty much agree on that. Now, that brings us pleasure, but it brings us a different kind of pleasure than something, you know, we can use a, an example of something that's very popular, unfortunately, in our culture, and that is pornography. Well, pornography is a lot of stimulation to the point that that's all that it is. It's not good. It's certainly not beautiful. It's in fact the opposite of that. It's ugliness. But people get pleasure out of it. It's a twisted pleasure, but it's pleasure. Now you can think of this in you know not so grotesque of terms. Um, if you think about just the nature of a lot of movies that people watch or music that they listen to, where you know perhaps there's music that has like a beat that you know makes you dance or makes you feel good, but there's no like real thought to any of the words, there's not really much of a tune at all, but it kind of it gets you stimulated in some way, so you enjoy it. Well, that's not the same as delighting in, in some kind of song because it was wonderfully written and thoughtfully you know, put together and skillfully played. So stimulation and that constant stimulation that we have for movies and TV and computers and smartphones um, has certainly not helped that. We get like games on our phones that you play all the time, and you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else. Uh, but but we've kind of replaced real pleasure and real enjoyment of something that is good with that kind of immediate pleasure of you know you need like the next hit of the like on Instagram or whatever. Uh, we 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 do this all the time. Okay, so these are some of the major cultural issues that lead to the loss of, of beauty in our world and why, and why it is that we're not emphasizing beauty as much as I think we should. Okay, now I'm going to ask this question. Is beauty in the eye of the beholder? Because as soon as you start talking about this question of beauty, the first thing that people are going to say is like, well, that's just kind of a, a, an opinion, right? You could think something is beautiful and I could think it's not. You think about music, like, we may have all have different tastes in music, and I'm sure that if I, if I went around and asked you, you know, what genre of music do you like, or what's your favorite band, you may all say totally different things, and one of you may hate the band that the other person likes. Um, you know, when you 
pick a spouse. You, you may find someone very attractive that somebody else does not. So what do we, you know, what do we do with that? Does that mean that beauty is just subjective? Um, well, my, my thesis is going to be that it's not. Uh, my thesis is that God is the beautiful, God is the most beautiful, and that when we look at the beautiful things in this world, when we see beauty, we're seeing a picture of God. And to say that beauty is just subjective and there's nothing else to it is to say that God is not beautiful. Because he certainly isn't just subjectively in our own heads or hearts or minds. He is objectively there. So, is beauty now the beholder? Now, I want to I show a couple things here. Um, I don't know how well you can see that. Um, but can you see that at all? Is that kind of hard to see with the light? Okay. So you see that there is this, this beautiful image of Jesus, and then there is this failed restoration of the image of Jesus. Now, this hit the news like a, a few years ago, and a lot of people were talking about this very, very hideous image. Someone tried to restore this picture of Jesus and did a really, really terrible job of making this ridiculous looking picture. But for the people who say that there's nothing more to beauty than just our own subjective feelings or our subjective approaches. Like if there's nothing, there's no rule or standard by which we can judge something as beautiful or not, I would say, well, what do you do with this? Do you really want to tell me that like this restoration, this weird blurry face that somebody tried to paint is really just as good as the other one? Do you really want to say that? Do you really want to say that, you know, a, a piece of music written by Bach is of the same level of quality as if I were to start, you know, banging on the table and screaming at the top of my lungs. I mean, would anybody honestly say, I mean, somebody might just to try to prove their point, but you know that that's not true, right? Like, we know that some things are better than others. We know that there are things that are more attractive to us than other things are. Here's another example people will bring up. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is a... Um, all right, all right. I've just got a couple of these. We can turn the lights on after just a, a couple of these. But, uh, but if you can see this, this is a, uh, an image of a home that's covered in a lot of wood paneling. No offense to wood paneling. I know there's a lot of it at the camp, and it's a very campy kind of thing. Um, so I don't mean any offense by it. But if you see a home like this, people probably think like, okay, at one time this would have been seen as like really cool, but it's pretty outdated. And people don't really think of it as that attractive anymore. So this may, maybe is against my point. Well, what do you do about the fact that like sometimes these things do change? Like there are things that we look at and we say like, okay, well at one time maybe I thought that looked really good, but my house really needs an update. Okay. Valid, okay, valid point. We do change our ideas about things. Sometimes you could look back at like clothing that you wore a couple decades ago and be like, okay, yeah, I, I, I don't like that. Um, you know, it's like when I look at, no thanks to the Gen Z people here, but, but when I look at, you know, college students today and I look at their clothing, I'm like, you dress like my mom did in the 90s. It's weird. <laughs> uh, but they find it attractive. So there, but there are shifts and changes. But I want to say there's a lot more to it than that. Because look at this, this next image. Buckingham Palace. Is there ever a time that this has looked outdated? What do you think? Do you think this would look outdated? Do you think in 20 years you look back at this and like, oh, Buckingham Palace was so ugly back then? <laughs> Probably not, right? So here's the thing. There are aspects of how we look at certain things and what we consider to be attractive. There are things that are trendy. Uh, so things change culturally. But to just stop there is really not the end of the story. Because even along with that, there are things that we would really all find beautiful. We find it beautiful because we understand that, we can talk about some of the specifics as we will about what makes something beautiful, but we look at the artistry, you know, the amount of work it, it took to make just the intricacy, the, the balance that we see in, in the various pieces around the room. Or, let's look at another example. This is a picture of a waterfall in, uh, in Ithaca, New York, uh, where I live. A lot of people go to uh, that part of the country to go look at the nature. There are 
are known uh, for being a lot of waterfalls in the area. They have like this saying, they've sure to say, Ithaca is gorges, because it has gorges. <coughs> it's gorgeous. It's kind of corny, but it's like the, the thing that everybody knows about. about it. Uh, well, why is it that people go there? Why do people spend time going to, you know, national parks? As much as you may look back at, you know, uh, the way that a house looked back in the 70s and say, okay, those carpets are ugly and outdated. Do you ever look at, like, a nice waterfall or a forest and, be, and say, like, forest is so outdated. <laughs> oh, those, that waterfall, you know, that, that was cool, like, back in the 80s, but those waterfalls are <laughs> So as much as like, there is some subjectivity in terms of what we perceive to be beautiful, there are always going to be differences among us. When it comes to natural beauty, that kind of challenges that thesis, I think. Because pretty much everybody is agreed that natural beauty is beautiful. You know, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't change depending on the person or depending upon your culture or depending on the point of life you're in or what's cool or what's not cool. This is why, for example, if you talk to uh, an interior designer, they, they talk about things that are timeless versus things that are trendy and change. And one of the things that people always say is timeless is plants. You're not going like, to look at the plants in your home and be like, oh, those plants are, are ugly. I want to get rid of those plants. And, and maybe there are plants that are ugly. But generally, they're going to have more of a lasting power because they're part of nature, this, this thing that God himself creates. All right. Now, uh, you can turn the lights back on probably at this point. Um, so, what's that? Wake us up with the lights. I know, yeah, yeah. It is to wake up. I don't, that's why I can't leave the lights off. I don't want you all to fall asleep on me. Uh, maybe I'm boring you, but you still have to stay awake. Okay. Um, well, I want to talk about how God relates then to beauty in creation. Uh, now, this says here, creation, chaos, the Enuma Elish. Uh, is anybody familiar with the Enuma Elish? It is. You are. You want to come up and tell us the whole story of what happens in that image? <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an ancient Near Eastern creation myth. And there are a number of these ancient Near Eastern creation myths. So these are creation myths in the ancient world, you know, around the place and time where Israel was given their, the creation story uh, that's recorded in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, so this is, is a picture of this fight between these two gods, uh, Marduk and Tiamat. And in this story, these, these two gods are in, in an epic fight. Eventually, uh, Marduk here attacks Tiamat. Tiamat's cut in half. This is like the goddess of chaos and, and sea. And as she's cut in half, the bottom half becomes like the ocean. The top half becomes the sky. So if you heard this story before, it's weird. But, uh, but there, are, there are a number of these kinds of, of creation myths. Now, why am I talking about this? Because there's something that is really significant when we look at the difference between the biblical creation narrative and the surrounding creation myths. And that is that the fundamental reality of a lot of those creation myths is chaos, war, strife. It's not order. There's order that comes out afterwards, but ultimately, why did creation happen? Was it because of, you know, God put all things in place to reflect something about himself? Well, no, it happened because there was a fight between these two gods that didn't like each other, and it just kind of happened. And then maybe some beauty came out of it afterwards. And it's a worthwhile study to look at some of these myths because it gives you such a good perspective on how different the God of Israel is, the God who revealed himself to us in Genesis. So... Let's compare that, then, to what we have uh, here with, with Yahweh as creator, the, the God that we see revealed in Genesis 1. Now, if you can't read this, don't worry about it, because um, I'll, I'll explain this. But basically, we have, in Genesis 1, the account of God creating. Now, there's no fight. No fight at all. There is simply God, right? In the beginning, God. He created the heavens and the earth. Well, how does he do it? He doesn't do it because he's in a fight with Satan and there are these like equal opposing forces and God wins out. No. God is, is pictured as this divine potentate. He's this king who sits on his throne and he makes commands. And they are obeyed. Let there be light, he says. Boom. Light. God commands. His speech creates. Whatever he says just happens. 
<clears throat> now, the creation account is, is recorded in a particular order, and, and it's purposeful. And so this, this order is that there are the six days of creation, then we have the seventh day, right, which is the day of, of rest. But, so we're looking at the six days of creation. Well, and this order says there are essentially three kind of realms that God creates on days one, two, and three. So first we have, uh, you know, there is the separation, right, of light from darkness. So light shows up right away. Uh, by the way, it's very significant in the creation account that light shows up before the sun does. That is, is quite a statement to the Egyptians, you know, the sun god Ra. Right? Most ancient cultures worship the sun as a god, which kind of makes sense because you look at the sky, you don't know what the sun is. You're just like, this is the thing that gives us light and gives us heat and all the things we want. It must be some kind of you know, benevolent thing that wants to give these things to us. Well, this is pretty radical to say, yeah, God doesn't even need that thing. Like, it's not just the sun's not God. Like, God doesn't even need it. He could just give you light anyway. So we've got the light and the darkness, these, these realms, on day one. And on day two, we have uh, the, the separation of the waters. So we have the waters above, we're told, or the, it's called the firmament. And then we have the waters below. Uh, then we have the land in, in day three. And then on day four, we see that the days, you see how they parallel each other. So we have the realms then are filled. So day one corresponds with day four. So we've got light and darkness. Now, in order to, to kind of govern light and darkness, God places sun and moon. Sun for the day, of course, moon at night. Then corresponding to day two, we have day five, which where God says, all right, I created you know, the, the skies here. Now I'm going to put some birds there to be the things that live in the sky. It's created the water, and he says, well, I'm going to put these creatures in the water, these fish. So you see, he makes the land, he makes the sky, he makes all of the places where these things live, and then he puts those things there. Uh, finally, we have, we have then the, the land, the creation of, of the earth coming out from the sea. Uh, and then on uh, day six, corresponding to that, we have the creation of animals on the land. And then we have the crowning jewel of creation, which is man. At the end of all of that, the man is told to have dominion over the creation that God, that God has made. But you see then, in this order, we see that God is particular. God is an orderly God. Why is it that we can see so much beauty in creation? Because it was purposefully made. It was purposefully made with order. It was purposefully made with, with meaning. Meaning like, you see the meaning that's here, right? The, well, why are the waters there? They're given for the purpose that the fish would live and thrive in them. Why was the land made? Well, the land was made so that the animals could live and thrive on that land. And we get further into this as well. We talk about God creating according to its kind. The notion of things being made according to their kind shows that there, there's something purposeful about them. There are, there are groupings. There's ordering of even the different elements of uh, the animal kingdoms. All right. So then we have, at the very end of the creation accounts, we have... Uh, man being created. It's the, the crowning jewel of creation. And we are told that uh, man and woman are created in the image of God. They're created in the divine image, which is not said of anything else in the creation account or of anything else in, in Scripture. So, uh, Genesis 1.28 says, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, what's going on here? We're told here that there is something, and I think this is about you know, man's image in God, something about how man images God, that, that man and woman have this kind of dominion over creation. There is a rule over creation that we have, that no other creatures have. You know, that the whales aren't given a mandate like this. But we have something distinct about us. And what does that idea of, of having dominion mean? Well, this is connected to what it means that we image God. Now, if the God who created us is a God of order and beauty and purpose, that means that we, too, are people made to image God with order and beauty and purpose. So this is really the groundwork for the arts. This is why we like to make things. I mean, we do this from, like, the youngest ages. 
You know, I watch, I watch my kids from, you know, the, t the time that they could use like blocks like Duplos. They were always like making these crazy designs. They'd make like these, you know, big robot kind of guys. And, you know, as soon as you give a kid like a pen and some paper, they'll draw all sorts of wild things. My, uh, my, my seven-year-old loves to, he loves to take trash. And I don't mean things from the trash can. I mean, like, if, if I, uh, you know, if I open something, something sent from Amazon, and I, you know, open it up and want to throw the box away, he's like, don't throw it away! And he's got a plan. And he, he thinks through all this stuff very, very deeply. And so he'll grab onto that and grab, like, the wrapping that came in it, and he'll cut things up and tape them together. And he's always got some kind of crazy idea. But he could put something together. Well, why can a kid do that? Seven years old. Why can he do such things? Because he's was made to be like God. Because God created him with that creative capacity that God himself has. So we can mirror that. And from the youngest ages, that's just how we are, and that's just what we do. Now, it, of course, it's you know, not true that everybody becomes a professional artist with their life. But we all have different ways of, of mirroring this creative work in our lives in one way or another. Now, I want to say something else about beauty in the Old Testament. Um, and this is, this is an, and it doesn't matter that much to see the specifics here, but this is just an image of, of Solomon's temple. Um, but that is, the beautiful things show up not just in Genesis 1, but throughout Scripture. So when God establishes the temple, when he has Solomon build the temple, God has very specific instructions for how the temple is supposed to be built and, uh, you know, what, what the temple is supposed to look like. So we have gold all throughout the temple. Uh, we have statues. There are cherubim, the images. We're told that he takes the most skilled craftsmen and tells them to do it, those who are the most talented artists, to make the temple beautiful. Uh, we have images of palm trees in the temple. When we look at the presence of God in the Old Testament, the place where God is, is present, I mean, most present in a, in a particular way for his people, it's, it's at the temple. And so beauty brings us into the sacred. God said, this is my place, this is the holy place, and I want it to be beautiful. And he used people to make it beautiful. And that tells us something about beauty. Beauty does, it brings us to the sacred. It, 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 even in our everyday experiences, it brings us outside of ourselves. You know, just think of when you, if you see a, you know, a beautiful painting or something that just strikes you, it does take you out of yourself, doesn't it? It takes you out of yourself to stop thinking about yourself, stop thinking about what you need to do, and all of a sudden you just look at it for what it is. It's true about music as well. You know, you hear a song and you just kind of get wrapped up in it, and, and all of a sudden it's like the things that you're worried about don't really matter because you have this song that you're hearing. That's, that's a kind of experience that, that's showing something about God. Because there we encounter meaning and beauty. Because even atheists do this. You could be the you know, most secular naturalist and think nothing exists in the world except the physical. There's no meaning. There's no purpose in anything. And those people still get emotional when they listen to certain music. Because, because you, you feel it in a particular way. This is why God established music to be used with the people of Israel. He had psalms. You know, you have the Spirit of God coming upon David to play music to calm Saul down. So there's something sacred about, about that that we encounter. Now, this image here is, this is the depiction of, of what's called Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Is anybody familiar with Plato's Allegory of the Cave when I say that? This is something, if you took a philosophy class in college, maybe a long time ago, you probably learned about this. But um, to, to summarize the point, the point here is, in this image, you have this man who's sitting on a chair, he's looking at this shadow. And, of course, behind him, you see this guy who's got like this, this bird puppet thing that's making the shadow, and the guy's just looking at the shadow. Now, when he sees the shadow, he doesn't realize there's anything behind him. And so we, in, in this allegory, we have people spend their whole lives just kind of staring at the wall of this cave. And all they see is the reflection. But Plato saw his role, the role of the philosopher, but, but he, he saw the role of the philosopher as one who kind of takes that person away and says, we're going to stop looking at just the shadow and turn you around. 
you know, as soon as you turn around, you see the real things as they are. You're not just looking at the shadow anymore. You seize the bird, right? Well, what does this have to do with beauty? And specifically, a Christian approach to beauty. When we see physical things of this earth uh, that we find delightful, and I'm not talking about, like, again, disordered pleasure, like we can enjoy things that are bad, but I'm talking about you enjoy something that's actually good. What you're experiencing, you know, when you listen to whatever your favorite musician may be, or look at art that you find beautiful, or that beautiful sunset, or whatever, what you are experiencing is a reflection, like a shadow, a reflection of God, God who is the beautiful. So in this world, we see those, those little pieces, those reflections of divine beauty around us. And, and the right response to seeing the beauty in the world around us is to look at that and then turn our eyes from there to the source, the ultimate beauty, the one who's not the shadow, that is God himself. Of course, as Paul tells us in Romans 1, it's not always what we do. We uh, tend to look at the physical things of creation and then just worship those things instead. That's part of sin, right? Or disordered desires. As we see the beauty here and say, well, that's what I need and that's it. But in its proper sense, the right response is to look at this, thank God for it, and then look to the source who has created these things and he's reflected it. So what are some things that... Um, that makes something beautiful. And I don't have, I have like 17 minutes here and I've got a lot of stuff, so I can try to go quickly here. Uh, so what are some things that, that make something to be beautiful? Now, I'm just going to give you, this is just like a classical home. One that you'd probably say, well, it's a nice looking home, right? Maybe not the most beautiful home you've ever seen. Uh, but I think it's a good illustration of some of the basic principles of what makes something look decently attractive, right? Uh, so one is proportion. Uh, if the proportion of something is off, we kind of are like weirded out by it. If things just don't look right, or right, something's a little too big, something's a little too small, a little too far to the right or far to the left, we kind of look at it and say, ah, something about that is just weird. But you've got this, this natural like tendency to be like, ah, I don't know about that. Or if you see somebody, um, like if you see a really bad piece of art, Oftentimes, it'll be like one ear is like way bigger than the other ear, right? And you look at that and you're like, okay. You know, what, what you're noticing is the proportion is off. That's why it looks, that's why it doesn't look right. Uh, well, then there's harmony. There's the, the notion that all things kind of fit together. This is true of visual arts. This is true of music as well. Uh, this is true of storytelling. So a good, a good story, all the pieces fit together. Um, okay, uh, then we have balance, which means like if you look at... You know, a lot of homes, and my wife and I purchased a home um, you know, just over a year ago. We bought our first home, and we spent a lot of time looking at houses. We looked at so many. Um, and I'm, I'm too, like, I don't know, nitpicky about things. That would, it had to look okay for me to buy it. Even if it was, like, a beautiful home inside and it looked weird, like the windows are off, I just, just didn't like it. Uh, so part of that is, like, you know, you look at some houses where part of it just kind of juts out farther off from the rest of it. Or like when you do an addition, like oftentimes additions don't look like they belong to the house. And it just makes it kind of less attractive because it, you got this big bump on one side maybe. Um, maybe the garage just like sticks out really far on one side so it just looks kind of weird. It, does, it just doesn't have, it doesn't have balance. Then, uh, it, you know, Aristotle in his book Poetics where he talks about... Uh, uh, what makes a good story? He, he makes the point that it really is it's when disparate parts, different parts of something come together and to form a unified whole is when we see it as beautiful. Uh, you know, so the example I give in the book of this is, one of the examples is going back to my kids, and I said they liked, when they were really little, they would play with Duplos all the time, and they're still young, but, but it's Legos, I guess, more than Duplos at this point. But, you know, if they take Duplos or Legos and... They had a bunch of pieces and they're thrown and scattered all over the floor. And I walk down and I look at the big mess on the floor. I'm not going to look at that and say, well, that's really nice. I'm probably going to be like, uh, guys, can you pick this up, please? Well, what happens if you have all of the same pieces, but they're constructed into some like, cool animal thing that they made? 
It's exactly the same material, the same stuff, the same general location. Well, what makes it beautiful now? Well, now I see intention and purpose in it because it's been put together. All the pieces all fit together well. This is, this is why like when, you, when people critique movies, oftentimes the critique is like, well, that scene was irrelevant. Like, why did that thing? Are you watching a TV show and there's like a, you know, a plot point that like just shows up somewhere and then it just is dropped? Well, why is that not good? Because it's not a reflection of beauty because it doesn't fit together. It doesn't actually fit the whole. It just didn't really fit with the rest of it. Okay. Um, uh, another early, uh, he's a Neoplatonist philosopher, so um, in the tradition of Plato. But he, he, he uh, has this text called the Aeneids where he talks about uh, beauty. And he says, you know, beauty is, it pleases the senses and it brings delight. So that's another element to beauty. And we have to recognize the difference between delighting in something and then just having sensations that are pleasurable. So, you know, think, how about food? We can use that as an example. You know, if you have a, a really delicious meal, uh, something that, you know, you go to some, like, really fancy restaurant and, and you have something that the chef prepared and, and it took him a long time and it's got all these expensive ingredients and you know there's a lot of skill in it and how all of the things come together. You know, you can enjoy that. And you can recognize, like, wow, that's kind of a, that's a beautiful meal. That was a like took a lot of work to make that meal. And this is something that you can really delight in. Well, you may also just you know really enjoy eating a slice of pizza at the gas station. <laughs> but you probably recognize like there's a little difference in the two things, right? Like this wasn't created with intentionality or anything. It's just kind of thrown together, frozen, shipped off, and they heat it up and you eat it and you enjoy it. But that's just kind of it, it's a uh, it's pleasing your appetites, but it's not beautiful, right? It's not delightful in the same way. Um, so also, that which is beautiful is that ultimately, which is that which aligns with the good. When we're talking about the good, we're really talking about God himself. So when these philosophers, you know, Plotinus and Aristotle and Plato, they all kind of say this. Now, they don't really understand the true, the full identity of God. But they know that there's this connection, that we're, we're coming into contact with something greater than ourselves, something transcendent when we perceive that which is beautiful. And so that means that which is morally good is beautiful. There's a connection between the goodness and beauty. Truth is beautiful, goodness is beautiful. So true beauty comes out of goodness and truth, which is why you don't see beauty in the unmade bed full of a bunch of empty bottles of alcohol because you know a, a alcohol gluttonous you know alcohol binge is not really a morally good thing and it's not therefore not a very beautiful thing either and when we're talking about beauty we can also talk about the beauty of, of character something internal now this is something that plato talked about but it's something that, that uh, scripture talks about peter mentions this you know, he tells us, like, you know, don't worry about the jewelry and fine clothing, but worry about a godly character. Like, the, so there's an internal beauty to a virtuous life, a life that is lived in accord with how God has created you to live. So that's a, that's a beautiful life. So there's something beautiful about living uh, as God has called you to live. So that's internal beauty. And we know this, don't we? We talk about people having a beautiful heart all the time. Uh, and we know that there are those people that... You know, if you think back to, like, high school, right, there are the, like, popular girls that are really mean to everybody, but they're really pretty. Uh, you know, and they're, like, ugly on the inside, but pretty on the outside. It just shows up in, like, all the teen movies and stuff. It's kind of a stereotype. I think of, like, Mean Girls or something, if you've seen it. But, uh, but if not, you've probably seen this trope somewhere, right? So, so we, we know that. And we see that all around us. Well... I have to talk about this because this is we are Lutherans after all, and uh, that means we've got to get to the gospel. Now I know this is all kind of first article creation stuff, and we're talking about this, and um, that's why the things that I've addressed are things that are are noticed by non Christians as well because they can see those what we call natural revelation, the general revelation. God has revealed parts of Himself through creation, which is why thinkers can look at something that's beautiful and all recognize the same thing. Now, they may not recognize where that comes from or what that points to. We do. 
So as we're talking about this notion of virtue being beautiful, we can also think about the reality of ugliness in what's in our hearts. Because not everything inside of us is beautiful. We live in an ugly world. We live in a world that has beauty, these reflections of God, as we've talked about and, uh, in music, in natural beauty, in the arts, in, in various different ways. Uh, but it is also a world of profound ugliness. And there's plenty of ugliness in music, and there's plenty of ugliness in visual arts as well. But we can think about the ugliness that's in us. And ugliness is a deviation from God's law. Because ugliness is the opposite of beauty. If God is beautiful, the ugly is the opposite, so that's what's against God. So ugliness is essentially anti-God, isn't it? So that means to celebrate ugliness is really what really goes along to celebrate sin. So when culture kind of dives into the celebration of a lot of sin, it shouldn't surprise us that culture also begins to celebrate ugliness at the same time. Because ugliness is chaos and disorder. All right. Well, we know that ugliness also is in us. Because that whole sin problem is not just something out there, but it's something in here. It's something that we all face. <clears throat> Doesn't matter how outwardly beautiful you are, we've all got ugliness in our hearts. So as we think about this, this theme of, of beauty and ugliness, this is something actually that Martin Luther talks about quite a bit, what I'm talking about here. Um, Mark Mattis has a book on Luther's Theology of Beauty, if you want to explore this, this aspect. And it's, it's a wonderful work. Um, but I have a text here from, from the book of, of Zechariah that I want to I wanna read to you on this topic. Okay, and starting in verse 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. What we have here is the prophet Zechariah has this, this vision, this image um, where we have Joshua the high priest who's representing the people of Israel. And he's representing the sins of the people of Israel. And this is embodied in this vision in the clothing that Joshua wears, which is filthy clothing. In other words, it's ugly clothing. So sin is the, the ugliness that's, that's on Joshua. So just as we, we sin and that sin is inherent ugliness, God sees that as ugly. That's what the law shows us. But in this vision, we see here that those ugly garments, or the filthy, dirty garments that Joshua has that are, uh, that are full of gunk and dirt and ripped or whatever they are, they're taken off of him. And we're told that his iniquity, his sin, has been taken away. But more than that, as his sin has been taken away, he is then given something beautiful. So it's not just that the sin is taken away, though that was wonderful enough. But we're told now that, no, he is clothed with rich robes. He's clothed with beautiful clothing. And this is, it's such a beautiful image that we have. And then he's got this turban put on his head as well. So he like goes above and beyond. He's got beautiful robes. He's got the turban. Probably not the outfit that you would wear around if you want to wear something that looks good. But this is the outfit of the priest. This is the outfit of, of the high priest, which is the significance of this. Um... So this is an image of what Christ does for us. He takes our ugliness on himself on the cross. He takes our sin, he takes our, our pain, and in turn, he gives us these beautiful garments. And think about the imagery that Scripture so often uses about our relationship to Christ. His relationship to the church is that of, of a wedding. When does a bride look most beautiful? 
at her wedding. You know, this is so the beauty of, of God is given to us. The beauty of Jesus is given to us. And there is this great exchange that Jesus takes our ugliness upon himself and then he gives us his beauty, his righteousness that covers us. All right, so I just want to, um, as, I, as I end here, uh, I know you probably can't see this too well, but this is, uh, this is a, a painting by Giuseppe uh, de Ribera from the 1620s it's called Lamentation Over the Dead Christ. I think it's a, it's a very beautiful painting. Um, but the reason why I, I grabbed this is because we have this, this dead body of Jesus. Now, as you think about something like death, it's not exactly the most beautiful thing. You think of death as being ugly. Well, why is it that, especially when you look at the Renaissance and then onward, when you see some of the most beautiful paintings, they're often of Jesus' death. Now, some people I know are going to say, well, they're, they're sanitizing the death of Jesus, and they don't really want us to see the bloodiness and pain that he really suffered. But I think they're kind of missing the point. Because the point of, of the art is not to say that the things that happened weren't bloody. They don't paint Jesus as, you know, full of all the scars of blood that maybe you see in the Passion of the Christ or something. There's, they, they know that, that, that he's not being painted as bloody as he was. But the reason for that is that they understand that this is what Christ does. He takes that which is ugly and beautifies it. And, then, and death becomes the gateway to life, right? Death, which is the ugliest thing, the death of the Son of God. In, in paintings, you see this it portrayed visibly, but it's a truth that's scriptural, which is that's where ultimately all beauty comes. That's where goodness comes is the death of Jesus. And you have this like paradoxical thing there that, well, how could death be the thing that brings life? How could death, the ugliest thing, become the most beautiful thing? But that's because that's what Jesus used to bring life uh, to us. So when artists do that, they're, they're showing that. They're, they're beautifying death, saying that in Jesus' death, there is beauty, somehow. And this then translates into what's nice called the aestheticization, I don't know if I'm saying that right, of, um, <laughs> of, of death in a lot of art, like in, in plays. If you look at like the plays of Shakespeare, often there are beautiful lines of someone's dying. Or if you ever watch an opera, um, you have... In, in operas, because I don't recognize most people probably aren't watching operas regularly. I am, but I'm weird. So, um, but when, when you watch an opera, one of the things that you, that you notice as you watch more of them is like, you, every time someone dies, you're gonna have like five, 10 minutes of them singing before they actually die. Like they're stabbed or they're poisoned, and all of a sudden they get up and sing this like beautiful song. And often it's like the most beautiful song in the whole opera. Like, well, that's weird, why are they doing that? Well, because I think it is a reflection of this, this Christian notion that there is something beautiful in death, and so it comes out even in, in the various forms of art and plays and literature um, that we have, that we see beauty comes even in the midst of chaos and death. Because ultimately, going back to creation, that's what God starts with, is order, beauty, meaning, purpose. And that's where it ends, too. And yeah, we've got all the chaos and death and ugliness and destruction all in the middle that we're in the midst of right now. But ultimately, that comes to an end with the coming of Christ. All right, it's been an hour. So I will uh, stop there, and um, I will take some time for questions. I don't know how long you want to give if people have questions. Um, what do you think? Um, maybe five minutes or so here. Five okay. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Do you cover everything that's in your B section on your book? Oh, no, there's plenty more. What else could you give us? You expect me to remember what I have in the book. I don't know. If you had highlights that you would want to share. Oh, man. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to think. Well, in the book, I give, a, I give kind of a whole history of art. Uh, and that takes up a pretty significant portion. So I talk about Christian art, um, the, the importance of art in places of worship. Uh, and, and so, you know, places of worship in, you know, in ancient Rome at first, at least, uh, were, you know, Christians were kind of just meeting wherever they could meet. So it's not like they had these elaborate, beautiful altars and songs. 
Um, but as soon as the church you know, had the freedoms to do those kind of things, the church did that. The church created beautiful music. Uh, the church put images all over the sanctuary. Uh, and that was, you know, there's a theological underpinning to that. There's a reason why churches look the way that they do. And that is because we recognize the order and beauty of God. And, and we also recognize that as we enter into this, the earthly sanctuary, as we enter into the, the, a church, there is this invisible reality behind that, that is heaven. Heaven comes to earth as we gather together. And what we see is the shadow. We see the shadow, right? We see the, uh, the you know, the altar there. Um, you know, you see the crucifix. We don't see the heavenly altar, right? We don't see Christ the Lamb seated on the throne literally. You may have a painting of that or something, uh, but, but you don't see it in a literal sense. But in some other sense, we actually are there, right? We actually are in the heavenly sanctuary as we gather together because of the communion of saints. We're part of that one, that one church uh, with, with the departed saints as well. So I spent some time talking about, about that um, Christian art and how that developed. Uh, and then giving a little bit of a, of a history of modern art, what happens in the modern world, and then where modern art becomes contemporary art, which is what we talked about before. Um, so the examples I gave of the ugly art, um, that's not modern art, it's contemporary art. People often use modern art as the kind of go-to label. But uh, there, there's, a very diff there's a big difference between the art of modernity, say, at Picasso, and the art of post-modernity. Because as you look at the art of, of modernity, they're still looking for purpose. And they're still doing things with intentionality. And that slowly begins to, to shift. I think the world wars really play a huge role in that as well. Things just feel meaningless. And I think that I like the art that shows up like around World War I because it shows, it kind of shows people in, in their vulnerable state searching for something, which I think we could speak powerfully um, one of the things I think get really bad is when all of a sudden there's no search for anything real. It's just destruction is all you're left with. But yeah, so that, that history is something I explained there. There's a lot more too. But yes? Could you compare what you have uh, stated in your book, say with uh, Francis Schaeffer's take on art? How is it similar? How is it different? Oh man, you're asking me to go back to Schaeffer. I haven't read Schaeffer since college, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to go back and, and revisit. I will tell you that, you know, figure has been very influential upon, if I can give you someone who's been very influential upon the way that I've um, thought through these issues is, is Roger Scruton, um, if you're familiar with him. He's not a, he passed away recently. Um, I guess he was a lifelong Anglican, but I don't know how faithful he actually was. Uh, but I think in terms of the connection between transcendence and beauty, he's really the guy who's probably influenced me more than anybody else. Um, but I, I don't want to speak publicly about Schaefer because I probably would get something wrong <laughs> not having read it in a little while. Yeah. And I had revisited some of those sources when I read the book, or when I wrote the book. But the, the problem with writing a book is like I'm always, as soon as I write one book, it's like my attention is just, okay, what's the next thing I'm doing? And then I forget half the things I talked about. Um, not very useful, but that's, that's, that's the truth. So. <laughs> Sorry, that's not a very helpful answer. Yes? So on your topic, why beauty matters. Could you expand on the obvious, the obvious thing? Because God's behind beauty. Yes. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sorry, that was, that was the answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so why beauty matters is because God matters. And because beauty is a reflection of, of who God is. So to say that, that beauty doesn't matter, uh, that people can just like whatever they like, and it doesn't, there, there's no relevance to it, uh, that... You know, for example, in architecture, we should just build our communities around, well, what fits people the best in the space, and that's the only consideration. Well, it, when you start doing that, you're essentially saying that the purpose doesn't matter, right? It's just utility. So if, if God matters, and he ordered the world, and he ordered the world in a beautiful way, we should absolutely care about things being beautiful, not in like a superficial way. But we should care because that's part of what it means that we are in the image of God. We appreciate beauty. We are to make things that are beautiful and reflect him in doing that. Uh, and we can bring joy and delight to others in doing that as well. Anything else? 
Yes, yeah, please. Works. So looking at this this last painting that you showed, the lamentation over the dead Christ, maybe just recall about how scripture talks about how in Christ's mm -hmm. earthly life before the resurrection and glorification, he's not exactly beautiful right. to look at. Right. Uh, which makes me think of the hidden beauty of, of God's work in the church, in yes. the world, and within ourselves as well. And so thinking then uh, how to reclaim this or to teach this or to instill this once again, is it simply just talking about God's work being beautiful even in its hidden forms or is it that simple or yeah well i certainly think that's part of it talking about it is certainly is certainly important i think we should talk about yeah the the beauty of, of god and, and yeah hidden like it's not like it's not like god is less present in an ugly church than a pretty church right <laughs> okay uh but so we, so we could talk about that um but it also we are also taught by engaging things with our senses like whether or not you want it to be the case you are formed by what you see what you do with your body what you hear and so those things all do communicate something to you as well. So I think when you do emphasize beauty in a, in a church service, you know, you know, you can think of some kind of grandiose idea of what this looks like. You know, we're not all going to have, you know, the most amazing thinger, singers in these, you know, medieval cathedrals or something. Um, and maybe you do, and that's great. But, but we should work on inculcating that some because it does, it teaches something. It teaches something about, about what's going on in this place. So I think the more that we you know, have good music and, and music that's intentional and um, care about the architecture of our sanctuaries, care about how things are set up and how things look, I think that really will, will speak. Um, yeah, I know that there was some kind of uh, study done in, in England over uh, where they were talking to new converts, this was a few years ago, I wish I remembered the details, but um, they were talking to newer converts to Christianity and had asked what had led them to their conversion to Christianity. And the, like, the most prominent reason was because they had spent time in a, an old cathedral. And it began to make them rethink religion. Something that ha that's happening in, in a lot of Europe is a lot of old churches are like converting to nightclubs and other things because just nobody's using them for church, for church buildings. But then they walk into this beautiful place and something inside of them like recognizes there's something different about this. Uh, there's a sense of, of the holy that you get in a sanctuary that's built a certain way. You know, you, you, you see, especially when you've got like the, you know, the huge ceilings, you encounter how tiny you are <laughs> and you see this beauty around you and it's so grand that it can really lead to a lot of questioning, and and it, it, it preaches. You know, it doesn't preach by, I don't mean, you know, don't preach the gospel to people, just show things that are beautiful, but, you know. Uh, but, like, it, it does have an impact upon us. And I think, a, really, a lot of the, we, we would like to think that we are these kind of logic machines, that we look at facts in the world, and we can just, like, evaluate them, like, what's real, what's, what's not, you know, what's the evidence for this? Like, we just don't work that way at all. We are driven much more in the decisions we make day by day by what we see as pleasurable or enjoyable. That's just the reality. Um, why is it that... You know, I'm a big fan of the Star Wars films. Um, not the Disney sequel trilogy. Uh, but if, if I have spent many hours watching YouTube video essays where somebody goes on for two hours about, you know, why The Rise of Skywalker is a terrible Star Wars movie. And I will watch it and I'll be like, that's great. But what, why am I spending time doing that? Like, listening to somebody critique something. Because I recognize something and I care about whether it's beautiful. And I know that it's not a beautiful story because the story makes no sense with the other movies and it's not original and there are all sorts of other problems. But, but why do we do this? Like, why do people spend so much time with, like, movies and music it really is beauty. It, it, it shapes so many of our everyday decisions. Why do you buy one house over another? Yeah, you may think like, oh yeah, I bought the house I did because um, you know, it made the most sense for my family. You think of like utility and stuff. Well, a lot of the reason if you're looking at a lot of houses, honestly, is because you're attracted to something about the house. Like it's, if you know anything about real estate, houses that are attractive sell much better than houses that are unattractive. Even if the unattractive house may be more like useful in some way because it has more space. Because that's just not how we function. We function, beauty's around us all the time. Our decisions constantly are made. But when, I, when we bought our new house, 
you know, for example, because the, uh, the kind of evolutionary story of this, right, the materialist evolutionary story is beauty is something that, and I can stop after this, but um, because I can go on a long time. Uh, but beauty is something that basically is there to attract you to a mate. And it's only there to attract you to a mate, and so therefore you can reproduce, and just the line can keep going. And that's what beauty exists for. Oh, that whole narrative doesn't make any sense with how we encounter beauty in everyday reality. Now, of course, yes, certainly finding someone attractive can often lead to you marrying that person and having a child. But is that really the only function that beauty plays in our lives? Uh, I use the example of when, when my wife and I moved into our new home, the doorknobs did not match, like upstairs. They had replaced some of the doorknobs and not replaced the others, and it drove me totally insane. <laughs> did it matter? Did the doorknobs work fine? Of course they worked fine. But I bought new doorknobs, and I replaced all of the doorknobs in the whole house. So, uh, it, why did I do that? Because I cared about how it looked. Like, it's not an evolutionary thing. It's you want a place that you enjoy, that you delight in. And we all make decisions like that. Um, so, I, I just think, and also another thing to point out with the evolutionary argument is, oftentimes we, the things we find most beautiful are like the most dangerous things. Because everything is about survival, the dangerous things would be ugly, but we love the dangerous things. Like, what are some of the most beautiful things in, in creation? Is when you have a giant mountain or a, you know, a cliff, or uh, you know, people ch you know, go like chasing storms. You've got storm chasers. Because we recognize that there's some kind of beauty in things that are so much greater than us that we can't control. Because that's such a reflection of God when we see those, those kind of things. Uh, yeah, that is the other part of the book. The book, the book that I wrote is very, um, it's kind of an apologetic focused book. So I'm um, using all of these things to point people to Christianity. Uh, it's not like super heavy handed in it, but I'm, I'm uh, yeah, that, that certainly is a purpose. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for giving me so much of your time. Appreciate it.